Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning to you. We are in this series in the Gospel of John. It's called Sent to Make, or Sent, um, to Make Disciples. And um, in the end of the Gospel of John, he, talk, he says this in John 20, 31. He says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you might have life in his name. And more than 90 times in his gospel, John uses the word believe. The question is why? What's going on in John's life? And we talked about this. John wrote this gospel. It was the last of the four gospels written. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written first. Mark, at least, was written many years sooner. And so as John is on, he's in Ephesus. He's, he was on the island of Patmos where he wrote Revelation, um, probably wrote his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But now he's in Ephesus and he's writing this gospel and he wants to get to the essence of what is important about Jesus Christ. And not that the other gospel writers who were inspired by the Holy Spirit didn't, but he wasn't just going to reiterate what they said. He wanted to get to it. I, I, I picture him as an old man. And, and as you get older, you know, I have the privilege of meeting with Tony Cusdis, one of our elder advisors. He's 86, 87 now. Been an elder, literally been an elder of a church longer than I've been alive. And, um, and, and I realize as I meet, get to meet with him every week about the message, the older you get, the more, the more the important things of life bubble to the top. And I picture that's what happened with John. As he got older, the important thing of li- things of life bubbled to the top. It, it reminds me a lot of the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote most of our New Testament or much of it. And if you read his letters in the order he wrote them, for example, Galatians and the letters to the Corinthians are some of his early letters. And they're very much about correction, about doctrine, and, which was needed. And the Holy Spirit wrote, wrote, inspired him to write that. But when you read some of his last letters, like Philippians and Colossians, do you know what sticks out? Things like love. Things like in, in Colossians, um, it's, it's more um, the supremacy of Christ is what Colossians is all about. It's like at the end of Paul's life, he goes, I want to get to what really matters. And what really matters is Jesus Christ, that he is God. And that's ultimately what the gospel writer here, John, does. He emphasizes believe so much because he, because he knows the only, di- the only thing that, that sets up our eternity to be with God for eternity is believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so our part in that, Jesus did his part on the cross. Our part in that, and Jesus talks about this a lot, is, simple, is two things. Repent and believe. Repent. Turn from yourself and turn to God. And believe in the promises of God. So that leads us to today's question. How do we hear and testify to the truth? As we talk about how he was sent to testify the truth today, I want to ask the question, do we believe him? Do we believe that God is who he says he is? That, that we are who he says we are? And that he will do what he says he'll do? And that's really what we're going to look at today as we, as we look at how do we hear those truths and then how do we testify to them? And I know some of you are here right now and you're doubting. Maybe you've never come to faith in Christ and you're, doubting, or you're, and you're doubting that he really is God. Jesus really is God. Maybe you've come to Christ, but, you're, but you have times where you doubt your salvation. Maybe you've just gotten to a place where you're doubting the promises of God. And I would ask you to, 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 I, I would ask you to sort of a secondary question. What proof do we look for? What proof do you look for when you're in a place of doubt? So when you, maybe you're doubting one of the promises of God, you're in a trial, you're in one of those refiner's fire moments. What proof do you need God to show you when you're in that place of doubt? So the question is, how do we hear and testify to the truth? The first thing is, we need to speak of a powerful truth. So turn with me to John chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up in verse 46. It's kind of where Chad left us last week. Um, And we're going to pick it up in verse 46 where he heals a nobleman's son. So it says, Therefore he, that's Jesus, came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water to wine. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. And there was a royal official whose whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now guys, so you know the distance between Cana and and Capernaum, where I, we walked that when I was in, in Israel in May, we walked that. It took us two days. It was well over 30 miles, and it's not flat. So, so, I want, so get the scene here. When it says, 
when it says in verse 47 now, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son. So get this, Judea is the southern part of Israel, where Jerusalem is. So this nobleman who's up in Capernaum, 30 miles from where Jesus is in Cana, hears that Jesus has come from about 100 miles south to, in Judea, in Jerusalem, because Jesus went back and forth multiple times from the northern part of Israel to the southern part of Israel. So what I want to recognize is word is out, right? How does this nobleman, I mean, they, they didn't have CNN, right? How does this nobleman, 32 days walk away, hear that Jesus has made his way back up from the southern part of, the, of Israel to the northern part of Israel, back up to Cana, so that he can come there and say, can you please heal my son? Because, G, because, the, because the fame of Jesus is getting widespread. Pick it up in verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. Wow. So get that scene. This man has walked 30 miles. It's a hard walk. It's much harder than the walk we did because the elevation, we got to at least go downhill more than uphill. So he's going up to Cana just to see Jesus. He says, he says Jesus, please come. I know you can heal my son. Jesus says, go. Your son is healed. And the man says, okay. Would we settle for that, for one thing? And the other question would be, does it surprise us that all Jesus did was speak and it's going to happen? It shouldn't, right? The psalmist writes, David writes in Psalm 33, but the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. I love how the New Living Translation translates that verse. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. One of the things when we were on the canyon hike last weekend, I can't believe it's only been a week around the canyon hiking, camping out on Friday night and freezing to death because it was 27 degrees. Or next week when we all go up to family, family camp, which is really called the all church retreat because you don't have to have a family to be there. That's why it matters. So somebody asked me that just a minute ago. Why does, it, why does the name matter? Because you don't have to have a family to go. Everyone should be up there. But one of the beauties of being up there is that we get to worship God in his creation. We get to see when we were, when we were camping out that night, we turned off all our lights and we'll, and we'll do the same thing up at retreat. And, and the stars are amazing. It just, you can't help but hear that passage in Isaiah 46 where he says, look at the heavens, that God called out the stars by name, that he spoke creation into existence. So if he did that, could he not speak and have this boy be healed from 30 miles away? Of course he could. John 1, the second week of the series, John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And nothing came into being that did not come into being through him. And apart from him, nothing has come into being. And then it says, what does it say in verse 14 of John 1? And that word that spoke creation into existence, that still speaks hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father. Right? His word is powerful. There's a scene that John does not record. It's, you're going to read about it in your daily readings this week if you're doing the daily readings that are on the back of your bulletin to kind of expand on today's message. You're going to read, there's a scene where a Roman centurion comes to Jesus, very similar to this nobleman, and he says, my servant is sick, and please come. And Jesus that time says, okay, I'll go. I'm sorry, he doesn't actually tell him to come. He just says, my servant is sick. And Jesus is like, all right, I'll go. Show me where he's at. And the, do you remember what the Roman centurion says to him? He actually says, no, I'm not worthy of you to come into my home. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus' response to that is, I have not seen this kind of faith, this kind of belief, even among my own people, as this Roman pagan believes. He can just, his word is powerful. He just takes him at his word. The word faith, and belief are, have the same root in the, old, or in the New Testament. So when Jesus uses that phrase, like in, in verse 48 when he says, you simply will not believe, in verse 48 what we just read, he's really saying You're just, you don't have faith unless you see it. And we know that we walk by faith and not by sight. So let's pick it up in verse 51. 
As he, that's the man who came to see Jesus, was now going down, his slaves met him saying, to his, saying that his son was living. So he's going back down to Capernaum from Cana. And it says, so he inquired of them the hour when, when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew, and I love this, it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. The moment Jesus said it, the boy got better. Now guys, here's the thing that's hard. Sometimes we pray and we read a promise and we, believe, and we do believe it and it isn't an instantaneous thing. God does not need time to fulfill his promises. Jesus did it right then. But sometimes he takes time because he's not done doing in us what the trial that we're in needs to accomplish. But, don't, but, but we shouldn't doubt it just because our timing and his timing don't match up. And then it goes on and says, And he himself believed and his whole household. This is the second sign that Jesus performed. And when he had come out of Judea, when he had come out of Judea into Galilee, the first was the water to wine. John picks seven signs through his gospel to, to show, to sort of, um, to testify that Jesus is the Christ. Right? We saw the water to wine. We see the nobleman's son. We're about to see a third one where he heals a man that was lame. Um, he feed, next week or two weeks from now after retreat, we're going to see feeding the 5,000. And we're going to see um, walking on the water is another one. Where he heals a man born blind. And then he finishes it, kind of finishes it all off with raising Lazarus from the dead. But there's a reason for that. It's because the passage that I quoted at the beginning of the message today, in John 20, 30, 30 and 31, listen, listen to what he says. We covered this um, the first week of the series. Therefore, many other signs, that word in Greek means authenticating miracles or testimony, many signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that in believing you would have life in his name. So what are miracles meant to do? What are signs meant to do? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. What are, what are signs do, made for? To what? Communicate some truth and, I think I heard somebody say it, point to something. Right? Point to something. So really, Jesus is just pointing to himself. And we'll see that in a minute. So how do we hear and testify to the, the, um, the truth? One, we need to speak of a powerful truth. We, we need to speak the truth that God has power. That when he speaks, things happen. When we go to his word, things happen. But we can't miss the grace that is in the truth. And we're going to see a little scene here where that's exactly what happens. So let's pick it up in verse um, one of chapter five. It says, after these things, there was a great feast. This, is, this isn't a party. This is one of the seven feasts of Israel. John doesn't tell us which one. It could have been the Passover, um, but it's one of the feasts of Israel. It says, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, there, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem, where we stayed for a couple of days, there are seven gates around the old city of Jerusalem. Some of them have actually been walled up by the Muslims when they took over the, um, the, the city hundreds of years ago because they didn't want the Messiah to return through those gates. So they put rocks, so they boarded them up or they, they walled them up because they thought somehow that was going to stop him when he comes back a second time. But there are, some of those gates are still active. They're most, most of them are fairly heavily guarded um, and people come in and out of the old city through these gates. They did back then too. One of them was called the Sheep's Gate. It's where they would bring the sheep in to be slaughtered for the Passover from Bethlehem up into Jerusalem. Just like Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, came up into Jerusalem. That's a story for, that's a message for a different day. So the Sheep's Gate, there's, it's called, um, it's, it's in Hebrew, it's called um, Bethesda, having five porticos. Now, w at the bottom of this hill, out this gate, you go down this hill, and there are, there's a, and this is true in a few places there in Jerusalem, but there's a pool. This one was the pool of Bethesda, and and it says, in these, in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first came, whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. So get this. What they, what they would do, and, and, and there's a lot of commentary about what was really going on here, but the water would start to bubble. The first people into the water would get healed from their sickness. So this man, 
It says, no, pick it up in verse 5. And a man had been there ill for 38 years. So for 38 years, this man's been hanging out there, I guess, waiting his turn. I don't know. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew what had already, that it had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, interesting question here. Do you wish to get well? It's an interesting question to ask a guy who's been lame for 38 years. Doesn't that seem like a no-brainer? But here's what's interesting. You know, we do a lot of counseling, Carrie and I do together, and, we do, and I do quite a bit of it um, individually as well in different forms. But sometimes you run across people who really don't want to get better. You know, they are, they are happy. Well, they're not happy. They're miserable, but their identity is so tied up in their misery, they can't, they can't let go of that because they're not sure who they would be if they really got victory in that. Guys, that is not true for everybody that's struggling with prolonged illness, whether that be physical or mental or any, any other. But there is truth to that that we need to look at. That sometimes Jesus looks at me and goes, Doug, do you really want to get victory in this? Because I don't think so. Because you keep going back to it like a dog to vomit. Now, verse 7, the sick man answered and said, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. So Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man, came, man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. What? This man, I mean, get the scene here, guys. This man has been lame, could not walk for 38 years. Jesus says, you're healed, pick up your pallet and walk. And all these Pharisees care about is that he's breaking a rule. They're not rejoicing in his, in his healing. They're, not, they're, they're, they're pointing out, wait a minute, this is not right. Re really? But then I have to stop and I have to go. But, but how often do we do that? How often do we deny the miraculous? Do we miss the grace of God because we're so busy worshiping God our way? Let me give you some examples. What if you're a cessationist, meaning you don't believe in the, the miraculous signs anymore, healings, things like that, right? That, that, that people are actually in places where the word of God is not allowed, like Iran, people are actually seeing the risen Christ and they're getting saved. Do you believe that? Some people don't. Do you believe that people steal, still can get healed? Some people don't. We pray for people. We anoint them with oil all the time here. If you need prayer for something, physical, mental, emotional healing, let the elders know we would love to pray with you because we believe people get healed through prayer, just like right here. But, do we, but are there people like, yeah, but, but that's not my experience. That's not how I worship the Lord. So that can't be true. So they miss the miracles when they happen. How about, let me be a little more painful. How about preferences in how we worship or how we live? What about things like homeschooling? Do you homeschool or not? That's a touchy subject here. I, it is. How about medical care choices? Do you take an Advil when you get a headache or not? Or use essential oils? I do both. You know what? Why not? <laughs> right? <sighs> My point is sometimes we forget to extend grace because we are so caught up in our way of doing things. And guys, if it ain't the gospel, get over it. Do we miss the grace of the gospel because we're standing for things that are not the gospel? That's the question. And I think, and, and honestly, I don't want to say, I think, I think even for some of those examples that I've used, even though we've had some interesting discussions as a family about some of those topics like medical choices and homeschooling, etc., I see a lot of grace extended here. I don't mean it to be like we don't extend grace, but we can always get better at that. Look at verse 11. It says, but he, the healed man, answered them and said, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up my pallet. So they said, who told you to do this? Because we want to go get him. He said, it's the one who healed me. Verse 12, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? So they want to they find this guy who's a Sabbath breaker. 
But the man who healed him did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while he was in a crowded place. And afterward, now get this, this is an interesting scene. So he leaves, Jesus leaves before he even knows who, who he is. It says, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, there's lots of things that could have been happening in that scene. It could be that the man is going back to throw Jesus under the bus and say, you know, I know his name now. You want to go find him? I, it could also be that the man was continuing to sin. Maybe he was faking being a beggar in the temple so that they would continue to pay him. And Jesus confronts the man and says, hey, you need to stop it. Like, stop this. I healed you. Get over it. I think, this is white space, we don't really know. Here's what I think. I think Jesus was more concerned about the man's eternity than he was about his physical healing. And because he had touched, he'd, he'd healed him physically, but didn't tell him about himself personally as the, as the redeemer of men. And so he goes back and he finds the man to say, I want you to know who did this to you. Because your physical healing is wonderful, but your spiritual healing only comes when you confess me as Lord. And so he's saying to this man, I, I believe he has already been gracious to the man by healing him. Now he's going to give him a little truth by saying, don't sin anymore. Get over yourself. Look to me. Here's who I am. And follow me. Now this man does. He has a test. This man is testifying now to the truth of Jesus because he goes back to those Jews and he says, Jesus did this to me. He has a testimony. Do we? Like, do we share our testimony? So look at your be in community. It's on the back of your connecting points. Look at your be in community. Kind of goes along with that thought. It says, one of the best things about being in community is we get to share our God stories. I love our core group because we hear story after story of how God is showing up in people's lives. That's true in, our, in, in the young adults group, I'm sure. That's true. It'll be true at retreat next weekend as we just get to hang out together and talk about here's how God is showing up in our life. And like this man in John 5.13, we can, in, in a very real sense, deny his work in our lives. How are, you going about, how are you going about your business as usual and not using your healing to glorify God? Guys, if you're saved, he's healed you in a far better and bigger way than this man who was lame for 38 years. Do we believe that? And if we believe that, are we telling people Jesus did it to us? Or are we going, I don't really know. I don't really know what happened to me. How might you become more involved in community so that you can share of the great things God has done? So the question today is, how do we hear and testify to the truth? First, we need to speak about a bold truth. God's word is powerful. We need to speak that, he, that, that when he moves, he makes things happen. But we can't miss grace that is in the truth. We can't be so caught up in truth that we miss grace. The third thing is, we should, we should expect attack from those who are denying the deity of the truth. And this is a huge point, and we're going to spend a couple minutes on this. Digging in your Bible. So hopefully you have a pen to mark with because you're going to need one in a minute. Look at verse 16. It says, For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So there's that, there's that rule following again. But he answered and said, My father is working until now and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Now get this. They're turning it up a notch. Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Guys, we're going to take a minute. I'm going to show you something because it was such a huge impact on my faith walk, on my faith journey. For those of you that don't know, I'm 48 now. For the first 24 years of my life, I did not believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, for, most of, for the first 20-something years of my life, I didn't believe that there was a God. I was an atheist. I moved from atheist to agnostic, which just means, yeah, there's a God out there, but he's not really interested in me. Right? But God... I would use this argument all the time when friends of mine from school would share Jesus with me, just, just talking about who Jesus was. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus, really, Jesus never actually said, I am, am the God, we're part of the triune Godhead, the Trinity, it's a mystery, but I am God. Jesus never said that. That's just not true, scripturally. 
So we're going to look at that right now. So hopefully, in addition to taking notes on your connecting points and, and things like that, you're also marking up your Bible. So I want you to, you're going to cross-reference here, marking up your Bible, some places we're going to go. By the end of this, you're going to have four or five scriptures, just in, not all of them by any stretch, just in the four or five chapters that we're near right now, I'm going to show you where Jesus claimed to be God. So we're in John 5.18 where it says the, they were wanting to kill him because he was making himself equal with God. Turn back a chapter to John 4 and verse 26. It says, Jesus said to her, so he's, he's talking to the woman at the well that Chad shared with us last week. It says, he said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, guys, there's two words in Greek that you need to know here. One of them is ami. It's E-I-M-I, ami. It means am. And the other one is ego, E-G-O, ego, like waffles. So that's got two Gs, I think. It means I. So when he is here in this passage, it says, Jesus said to her, I, ego, who speak to you, ami, am. The he is implied. It should be in italics in your Bible. Because they, the, 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 to, to translate it, the translators put that in there so it makes sense to us. But to that woman, it made perfect sense. He is connecting the dots of personal, I am. Okay, and hang on, it gets, it, gets, it gets better. Turn to John 6.20. In John 6.20, he's walking on the water. You're going to see this in a couple weeks when we get back from retreat. He's walking on the water and it says, and I've taught on this a few times, it's, it's a great scene in scripture. He's walking on the water, there's this big storm, his disciples are in the boat and they're afraid, and he says in verse 20, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. In the Greek that actually says, it is ami ego. He's saying, it is am I. Now he's playing with them a little bit. He is trying to show them something. He's trying to show them that the great I am Exodus, right? Exodus chapter 3, tell him I am is the one who sent you. He's saying the great I am is with you. But he's a little fuzzy about it in this scene. So let's pick it up in a scene where he's not quite so fuzzy. Look at John 8. So again, you should be writing these down. So, so hopefully like next to John 6.20, you put John 4.26. So we've got John 4.26. We've got 5.18 where we started. We've got 6.20. Now look at 8.24. 8.24. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's having this long dialogue with them. And, he, and he's, he's in a pretty hot conversation with these guys because they're trying to, they want to kill him because he's claiming to be God. And it says, and so he puts it in their face almost. He says in verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. Doesn't get much uh, more in your face than that. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Guess what the phrase, I am there, is in the Greek? Ego ami. He's saying, unless you believe that I am. The he, again, is written in there by translators, so we understand it. He didn't say it there because they exactly knew what he meant. He is saying, unless you believe that I am the I am, you will die in your sins. And he finishes the thought for us, in verse 58 of John 8. So turn to John 8, 58. Because then they start confronting him with details like a lot of skeptics do. And, well, wait a minute. We, our father is Abraham. And they're having this whole debate about who, the, who their father is and everything. And you're not old enough and, and, um, to really be the I am and everything else. And he says in verse 58, it says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, ego ami. Before Abraham was even born, I am. I want to show you one more, because sometimes people get lost in the Greek, and, I, and, and frankly, I do too. But I want to show you one more that doesn't require any language to prove that Jesus claimed to be God, just in something he did. Turn to the last scene we're going to look at. It's in John 9, starting in verse 35. So he doesn't, this isn't about a Greek study. This is just watch what happens here. Verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, this is the man he's healed from blindness. And we'll look at that actually in the new year, Lord willing. We won't get to this part of John until January. But he says, do you believe that I am in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? 
And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. Now get this. Here's how Jesus shows us that he is God. And he said, the man said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now how does that show that Jesus is God? Because Jesus allowed him to. No place in Scripture, in, 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 in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when an angel, when Gabriel shows up to Daniel or whoever, whoever it is in the Old or New Testament, so a heavenly being even, some, somebody, something far more holy than us, shows up and they fall at their feet and start to worship. What does the angel always say? Do Don't do it. I am just like you. I am not worthy of worship. Right? Any, any good rabbi, any good moral teacher of that day, when that man fell at his feet to worship him, would have said, whoa, get up, son. You are worshiping the wrong dude because he is God, not me. Unless he is God. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to allow this to happen because I am the I am. Guys, get this, and here's why I wanted to blame, because, because you all know people. Some of you may be those people, but you all know people who are now where I was 24 years ago. And in the midst of this intellectual argument about who was Jesus and was he really a, just a good moral teacher and all these things that, that, you know, that, that we wrestle through like in our, in our minds and in our arguments. Guys, the truth is, and, and we can look at the other gospel writers too, there is no doubt that Jesus claimed to be God. And you don't even have to go to the Bible to prove it. Here's the thing. The fact that a, if, if all you were is like I was 24 years ago, I believe that Jesus was a man. I came to a place where I went, I believe Jesus was a man. I believe he really lived. I believe he was really crucified because he was teaching something that everyone else wasn't smart enough to understand and they hated him for it. But here's, here's, the, this, the, here's the thing. Outside of even scripture, the only historical reason for Jesus being crucified that other historical writers like Josephus talk about is that he claimed to be God. They would not have crucified him had he not claimed to be God. Now, the Pharisees hated him for a lot of reasons. They were, they were, he was undermining their ability to control people, to get money from people, to do all... So, so they disliked him for lots of reasons. But they couldn't very well go to the crowds and say, hey, this guy is, is undermining our ability to control you. So let's kill him. That would not have worked. So what did they say? This guy is teaching heresy because he's claiming to be God. That is the extra-biblical, that is the historical reason Jesus was killed. If he had not truly claimed to be God. So, so get help your friends. Get rid of the argument I used to make all the time. That Jesus somehow never claimed to be God. That is scripturally and historically simply not true. And the only reason I ever said it 24 years ago is because someone told me that and I just believed him. But here's one of the things that happened. In 1991, I have, there's a little note from a friend of mine that I went to college with. In 1991, someone gave me this book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. They, they, I, at this point, I had become an agnostic. I was reading my Bible a little bit and just trying, you know, and talking to a lot of Christian friends and stuff. But they knew I was a, I was a science geek. My, my degree was in chemistry and biology. And, and they knew that I was a very heady person. I had to reason things out. I had to, so this is a great book for that because this, I mean, C.S. Lewis will melt your brain, right? They handed me this book and they wrote a very nice thing in here. But it says, um, at the very end, it says, I hope you enjoy this book. It's deep and profound. It takes some concentration, but it is well worth the effort. God bless you. And this person knew I wasn't a believer. Two years later, I came to Christ. But I want to read to you the quote out of this book that, that helped, God helped move me in, like towards him in. I was going to see if I could find it actually in the book, but that's okay. I'll read it out of my notes. It says, this is C.S. Lewis talking. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. And this is so where I was. So where most, so where many people in the world are. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't, I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing you, may not, you must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. 
he would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Amen. Guys, skip down in our, go back to our passage in John. I, I, I don't know where I left you, but we're going back to John 5. And skip down to verse 24, because this is why it matters. I mean, this is why the gospel matters right here. Jesus is going to cut to the chase in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Guys, this is why all, everything I've said for the last 30 minutes even matters. Look at your engage in the call section. And this is why we need to share it, which is what the engage in the call section is about. It's on the back of your connecting points. It says this. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And we are to walk in the same manner as he walked. The dots seem pretty clearly connected, don't they? So why don't we go and make disciples? Apathy, for some. Misplaced priorities, for many. But even for those who are overcoming these... Fear of rejection, ridicule, attack, or persecution often is what holds us back. Like Jesus, his disciples, the early church, and even the reformers 500 years ago, like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Holdeck, Hold, Holdrick Zwingli, where we must learn not to only accept it, but also embrace it, if we were to truly make a difference for the gospel. And that brings us to our last point, and it goes quickly. So not only do, do we need to do these, in order to testify to the truth, our last point is we must believe and receive the testimony of the truth. Go to verse 32 of chapter 5. The whole last part of this section, here's what Jesus is doing. Because he's in this confrontation with the leaders, and, and, and they're basically saying, you don't, who, who, who testifies to the truth that you are who you say you are? Jesus is going to point out five things that testify to who he is. We're not going to go through them all. I'm just going to point them out. In verses 25 through 29, Jesus points out the first one. The resurrection and the coming judgment is going to testify to who I am. John 5, 20, those are John 5, 25 through 29. The resurrection and the coming judgment are going to testify to who I am. The second one. In John 5, 33 through 35, many of you have pericopes in your Bible that break these all out this way, those little, little headings that we insert in your Bible. John the Baptist, he says, John the Baptist testified as to who I am. Third one, John 5, 36, the works I do, the miracles I perform, right? Attesting, that word there means attesting miracle. So he's saying the, the miracles that I do testify. Fourth one, John 5, 37 and 38, the, my father testifies to who I am. And the last one, and this is where we're going to go into our time of communion with, he ends with kind of where he started in this whole thing, the power of the truth of his word. Look at verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think, of, you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Guys, do you, and he goes on to kind of elaborate on that, but do you get what he's saying? He's saying, guys, you look in here to somehow find proof and you're missing me altogether because this is me. This is me. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten full of grace and truth. He's saying, we dig in here going, prove it to me, God. And God's going, you're holding the proof in your hand because this is my son, Jesus Christ. And I look and I think, how long did I search the script? I mean, that so describes me. So the question is for us, and I'm not going to get on my soapbox about being in God's word every day, but do we take him at his word? Do we simply believe 
He is who he says he is. That we are who he tells us we are. That you, if you're his, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That he has called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light so that we can proclaim his excellency. That's what he tells us. Do we believe it? Do we just take him at his word? Are you in a place of doubt? Doubting he is who he says he is? Doubting you are who you say, that you really are loved by him? Regardless of what you did last night, regardless of what you're going to do today, grace is sufficient. And, amen. And power is perfected in weakness. And do you believe he is going to do what he says he's going to do? I close with this, and then we'll give you some time to react to his will. In John 6, 29, it's, Jesus says this. This is the work of God. It's all God, guys. I can't make you believe. I can't make you believe unto salvation, and I can't make you believe unto sanctification. I can't. I can't make myself do it. For it is God who is at work in me both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. Jesus says, this is it. When, it all, when it's all boiled down, this is it. Do you believe that God sent me to save you? So take a minute and just be quiet before the Lord. I'm going to close in prayer in a minute. But the reacting to your will part asks two questions. What is the Spirit saying to you about that? And what is Jesus asking you to do? So Father, I just, um, I thank you for the truth that we just read. That the work of God that you do on our hearts is to believe in the one whom you sent. And yet, Father, I know, I know I'm not alone in this where I often feel like the man whose child was sick and Jesus said to him, do you believe? And the father said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. There are so many times in my walk, Lord, that you could say, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But just like you did for Peter when you pulled him up out of the water and put him back on top of it to walk him back to the boat. You care for me. You care for us. You care for your children. You pull us out of the filth that we're in, out of the distractions of this world, out of the things that, that take our eyes off of the beauty and the majesty and the glory and the power that is your son, Jesus Christ. Because we try to fill that void with junk But these things are written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing we would have life in his name, for there is power in his name. There is no other name on heaven and earth by which people can be saved. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for those in my part of your world that don't know you, that don't profess you, that don't believe in you. This is the work of God. Lord, make them believe. Do what you have to do in their lives to drop them to their knees, that they might cry out to you and call you Lord and Savior, that they would follow hard after you. Lord, I pray that for all of us that claim you as Lord and Savior, that you would do in our lives what you have to do, that we might cry out to you and call you Lord and Savior in the moment that we doubt, in the moment that we're distracted. Because someday, Lord, 
we know you will return in power and glory and you will knock those bricks out of those gates and you will bring down the new heaven and the new earth and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess you as Lord. But at that point, for those who have not done so willingly, it will be too late. May that drive us to a place, may that compel us to a place to not stop speaking about that which we've seen and heard, to testify to the truth of who you are, of who we are to you, to what you're doing in our lives, and to what you've done for us in the grace of Jesus Christ. We celebrate that. Thank you. Doesn't seem sufficient, but thank you for your grace. In Jesus, amen.